All right. Welcome, everyone, to uh, another installment of the Trino Meetups. Uh, my name is Brian Olson. I am a developer advocate at Starburst, and uh, I just wanted to uh, do a quick round of uh, intros before we hop into the meat and potatoes of the subject today, which today we'll be uh, getting joined by uh, by Andre Rosa. Um, he uh, he is uh, one of the engineers uh, behind the um, uh, behind the project Tardigrade, which was the uh, initiative to essentially add fault tolerance capabilities around uh, Trino uh, to basically make it a lot more easy to um, adopt as a uh, as a batch query engine, and uh, and so there and and among other reasons, right? Uh, sometimes there are resource contention things like that, and so uh, what uh, he'll be talking to you all about today is getting into uh, calling this ex extract Trino load, which is the common uh, kind of uh, an, um, the common, um, why, why can I think of <laughs> the name for when you abbreviation, the common abbreviation for uh, um, extract transact load. Uh, and so we're basically saying Trino is a very uh, solid uh, system to use for that, uh, that transactional part of the ETL and, and particularly very suited for, uh, for batch querying. Uh, it always has been, but, uh, but now with fault tolerance capabilities, we think it's going to make it a lot easier for the general public to, to, uh, set it up and, and use it for these purposes. So, uh, so really excited to dive into that. Um, before we do that, uh, here's the quick agenda that I have. I just a couple community, uh, things I'm going to talk about and, uh, and then, uh, do I, uh, surprisingly today, uh, I'm fortunately for those that are huge need to fans, uh, I will be the one doing the Trino and Starburst overview as well. Um, need to is out with a cold today. So, uh, so she will come back hopefully, uh, ready and, uh, and excited in July to, uh, tell all of our Trinubies and, and folks that are not familiar yet with Trino, uh, what Trino is and what Starburst is. So I will be doing that today though. And then after that, I will be handing it off to Andre. Uh, and so let's get jumping right into this. So, um, so quick uh, round on uh, community. Uh, if you are new to this community uh, and you want to know kind of where to get started, uh, I, the the de facto place that we typically send almost anybody is to our Slack channel. Um, obviously, go to our website, you know, trino.io. Uh, but then, uh, if you're looking for a place to interact and, and find people, um, the a lot of us are just basically sitting around on on Slack, just waiting for uh, new new community members to come in and ask us uh, really intriguing and engaging questions. So, um, so definitely hop onto Trino Slack. Uh, it's at trino.io forward slash slack.html. Uh, and uh, essentially, um, you'll join up if you haven't joined a Slack before. Uh, basically, it'll just add you, to, uh, ask you to basically have some sort of sign-in method, and then uh, you'll you'll join the Slack channel. Um, Likewise, if you're not necessarily wanting to just go directly talk to a human, but you wanna, you like hearing me talk, uh, as well as uh, you know, I have a partner in crime on this uh, next little uh, uh, bullet point here named Manfred. Uh, we, me and my friend Manfred uh, are basically just talking about cool things going on in the Trina community on this uh, show called Trina Community Broadcast. And what we do there is we uh, we break down different things either about the core Trina query engine. Uh, Trino ecosystem, uh, architectures, things like that, uh, and just also give updates on release notes and uh, show cool, fun little demos. So if you want to, if that's kind of the your style and you like to kind of listen to things in like a YouTube or broadcast type type manner, uh, go to trino.io forward slash broadcast, and uh, we have a whole bunch of episodes for you to, to catch up on and check out there. Um, you are here now in the Trino virtual meetups, uh, but we do have them uh, currently split out into three regions. Uh, this is currently the Americas. We are scaling up some in EMEA and uh, in the near future, we'll be scaling up some in APAC. So if uh, you have friends in that region or you are in that region and you're currently just tuning into the Americas, thank you for joining, uh, for being from all across the other side of the world. Um, but uh, we'll hopefully be having a lot more locally in your area uh, in the coming uh, months to, uh, uh, well, yeah, in the coming months. So um, if you want to learn how to contribute, uh, if you've been wanting to contribute to an open source project, uh, go to trino.io forward slash development. And, um, and then, you know, you can also do this in the form of uh, 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 de de deploying or sorry, uh, contributing code, you can also contribute uh, documentation, uh, which is also 
like kind of sitting with the code. And then there's also ways that you can contribute otherwise, uh, being on Slack and answering people's questions or, um, or joining the, uh, for write, writing a blog essentially and uh, contributing that. Um, those are all ways that you can actually contribute. And so, um, so these are all uh, kind of links that uh, if Anna, if you could uh, add that into the, uh, uh, into the comments uh, here in a second. Uh, that way, the nice folks at home don't have to necessarily uh, really quickly write all this down. So, um, uh, so yeah. So that's one way. And then another final way, and uh, this is relatively uh, not as new as it was whenever I first put this whole separate slide up. Another very engaging way to to start getting involved with folks is uh, Trino Forum. Um, thank you for that, Anna. Um, and so. Um, Basically, uh, that that resource that uh, just came up is has all the uh, community res resources that I'm sharing with you right now, uh, all on one page. Um, so, uh, so basically, the Trino forum is a uh, uh, is a discourse forum. You might you know not not to be confused with Discord. Uh, it's kind of your typical question and answer forum, kind of like Stack Overflow, but we we do a little bit more with it. We we also make it places where people can just kind of post their their projects and uh, and kind of uh, tutorials. Um, and it's also just a um, a really cool way to kind of have um, uh, core people that are you know kind of sitting there talking on Slack. But essentially, when we have these conversations there in Trino Forum, uh, this gets actually picked up by Google, and it makes it a lot easier for new folks to find uh, good, like all these answers. Um, unfortunately, Slack kind of keeps it a little hidden away. And so we're trying to actually kind of expose some of those conversations in Slack and uh, organic conversations uh, that are um, that are coming up uh, uh, within the Trino forum itself. So, so, um, so definitely take that, uh, take a look there and I would love to have you on that forum as well. Um, finally, uh, for joining here today, if you have not gotten one of these, uh, awesome commander bun bun, uh, t-shirts, um, one of this link here is also included in that community resources. Um, the, uh, you just got to click on this, uh, this URL down here and then uh, si sign up for whatever size shirt you need. Um, and provided that you are in one of the areas that we can ship to, then, um, oh yeah, here we go. Thank you uh, again, Anna. Yeah, sweet. <laughs> so uh, so that one is also now uh, added in the YouTube comments. Um, so click on that, uh, fill out the form, and if you're in an area that we can actually send these to you, which a good good chunk of, of you should be, uh, then uh, then we'll, we'll send that to you. Otherwise, we'll send you a, a gift card. Um, great. So uh, any questions? Um, obviously, during this talk uh, or after the talk, uh, do let us know in either the YouTube chat. And of course, after the talk, please check out the Slack. Um, and then uh, for uh, you know other questions that you want to more generally pose, definitely uh, we'll take it on a Trino uh, a Trino uh, on Twitter. Uh, at, if you uh, follow us at uh, at TrinoDB and just uh, you know or, or uh, kind of uh, uh, tag us, uh, that is the handle that you can use. So uh, with all that, uh, I will then go on now to the uh, the, the typically need to section, which is going to be what is Trino and what is Starburst. So uh, if you're new here, welcome. Uh, let me do a quick little rundown about our um, about uh, this uh, software that uh, we're so excited about and and uh, so passionate about. So Trino uh, actually was not originally called Trino. It was uh, originally called uh, a, a open source uh, project called uh, Presto, and uh, uh, was recently rebranded in uh, almost a year, almost getting close to a year, yeah, a year and a half ago. Now it was rebranded to Trino. Um, the three original founders uh, were working at Facebook, uh, Martin, Dane, and David, as well as actually there's kind of a fourth uh, who, who uh, joined the project like right after these three started it, uh, named Eric Huang. So those four, those four members basically uh, started out with Presto, uh, were creating this, filling in this void of, uh, you know, uh, Facebook was facing a lot of like slow analytic issues uh, using Hive uh, at, at a high scale of like, you know, actually the data warehouse at the time was 300 petabytes. I'm sure Andre has better stories of uh, his time at Facebook uh, was probably scaling up way, way higher than that. Um, but uh, they were trying to run these very interactive analytic queries and, and had a lot of uh, data scientists and uh, even data engineers that were trying to kind of uh, do experiments and were having to wait, you know, 
hours to, to days uh, for, for these queries to finish. And so Presto was a, a way to solve for that. Um, one of the initial things that these three wanted to uh, address from the beginning is they knew that making a healthy open source project rather than keeping this something internal in Facebook was going to be something very core to uh, how they could make this, this uh, software successful by not only just taking in the needs of immediately Facebook, but also trying to get in uh, a lot of the uh, direction and help from from uh, you know companies initially in the valley, but now has grown out to quite a few more. So, um, so let's talk about what actually is Trino. Um, so Trino, uh, as opposed to kind of its Hive predecessor, uh, it's an MPP SQL query engine, uh, and so uh, as averse to Hive was uh, basically a uh, an abstraction layer of of kind of SQL that was uh, essentially being generated into these MapReduce models. So um, MPP has uh, is a lot more tighter, tightly integrated with things that that uh, are essentially couples much better with with SQL um, and has a lot of these operators that uh, that that are you know very pipelineable and and uh, work really fast in terms of uh, avoiding any types of blocking and things like that. So it makes this uh, query engine very super fast. Um, so Trino has uh, uh, now um, proven scalability up to multi petabytes. Has run in multi in, in a whole bunch of uh, um, big companies in the valley, and uh, has also has also been a very uh, more and more adoptable project by uh, mid mid to low level uh, even startup uh, companies that are uh, that are really starting to uh, take their, uh, advantage of the benefits there. Uh, it's super community driven open source project. Uh, one of its you know great uh achievements is the fact that this uh, query engine was uh uh something that is um essentially uh constantly taking in innovation and, and change and and issues and new direction from the community and trying to basically stay stay the course of not trying to uh focus on a, a particular smaller set of problems it's essentially trying to keep up with changes in in how people are using the software um, separation of compute and storage is, is core to, I think, any very successful query engine these days. And Trino is, is definitely no, no different there. Um, you know, you obviously want to scale storage and compute, uh, separately, but then there's this extra added benefit that Trino has on top of just splitting those up, uh, has a lot of this ways to abstract the connections across these diff different uh, storage layers. So uh, you can have, you know, Hive, which was the original one that they were replacing, but now you can actually connect to RDBMS solutions like MySQL Postgres or NoSQL solutions like Mongo and Elasticsearch. Uh, and you can actually run queries across all of these different uh, data stores. Um, and then finally, you know, they're, they're, uh, you can deploy this uh, anywhere, cloud, on-premise, uh, works very well in cloud now with a lot of S3 integration. Um, and uh, you know, taking advantage of Kubernetes, there's a Helm open source Helm chart now uh, to actually deploy all these. So okay, so that's what Trino is. But what is Starburst, and like you know, who's paying me the money to actually sit here and talk to you about this awesome open source project? So, um, so Starburst is a is a distribution of of Trino. Uh, and actually a couple distributions. In fact, we have uh, an enterprise uh, product called SEP, uh, Starburst Enterprise uh, Platform, and then there's uh, Starburst Galaxy. And so SEP is uh, is kind of a still very similar to a deployment, a similar deployment that you would have with, with Trino, but instead uh, we have extra connectors, um, a lot of uh, uh, modified uh, uh, security and enhanced uh, uh, Capabilities around security, but then uh, you you also have obviously then the support and um, and uh, a lot of extra uh, small little bells and whistles and in, in there that you know from a from a deployment aspect we make it a lot simpler. Um, Starburst Galaxy, on the other hand, is is what a lot of people are kind of in the cloud environments are much much more uh, apt to expect these days, which is it's a SaaS offering for, version of Trino. So instead of having to deal with scaling and and all these other uh, things that you typically have to think of when you do this deployment, uh, you know, Starburst Galaxy takes that kind of like pain away from you. So you're able to just use Trino. Um, you're able to scale it up as you need it to, and you don't have to be doing all the heavy lifting to actually manage that infrastructure. So, uh, so it's really exciting, uh, um, to uh, to have options like that, especially for those kind of like you know companies that don't have the full on uh, engineering crew to really be managing a lot of this stuff that uh, um, you know the Silicon Valley folks are. 
So, um, so ultimately, you know, uh, this is a very busy slide. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, I admittedly, uh, I, I, I always get nervous when I see slides like this. I don't know how to even t begin talking to them, but you know, you think about this is like, you know, you have a lot of people that are, are using, um, kind of anything from a BI, uh, type of use case all the way to data, data science type use cases. And so you have different people, different stakeholders that have all these various needs. Um, you need to make sure that they are addressing specifically their their needs and nobody else's needs or, or having access to uh, certain data stores or certain things that they don't need. So Starburst Enterprise and Starburst Galaxy really add a lot of these like, you know, data masking, data encryption, in, in integrations with other uh, um, companies like Amuda and, and, uh, uh, and, and all sorts of um, uh, kind of bigger ecosystem partners that we have that ultimately make a lot of this just like very much open up, get things connected, uh, fill out some like GUI and then click, click next and you're done. And so, um, so this is kind of, uh, where, you know, uh, on the enterprise side where we, we kind of envision taking Trino and making it a lot more, uh, scalable, a lot more, uh, just taking a lot of the headaches away from, uh, from our clients. So, um, so essentially, uh, that is uh, the kind of differentiation between what is Trino, what is Starburst, and uh, I think I'll leave you with that. Uh, if anybody has any questions, um, do you free, feel free to leave it in the chat, and I'll I'll, uh, I'll be glad to answer. But now, the moment that you've all been waiting for, um, I would like to uh, hand this over. Uh, give me a moment to Andre. Hey, Andre, how's it going? Hey, doing uh, so, uh, good. So, yeah, so uh, uh, really excited to hear about this. Um, you know, uh, as I kind of get alluded to, uh, this is going to be talking about some of the work that you and the whole rest of the Tardigrade team, uh, I'll just name a couple of them, Joe Bing, Luke Cash, uh, Martin, Brian John, uh, and I hope I, did I miss any, uh, Josh Howard, and anybody else I'm missing off the top of my head of, the, of that team that is uh, really heavily focused on this? No, I think that's about everybody, uh, right? Martin has been working closely with us uh, as yeah. well. Martin Traverso, right? So, uh, so yeah. So, uh, you know, just wanted to say a huge thanks to all of all of you, and I'm really excited to hear about uh, what you all are have been working on. And uh, uh, take it away. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Andre. Uh, so, I'm a software engineer working for Starburst. Uh, I'm also a Trino uh, maintainer. And today uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, Trino as an engine for large-scale batch e ETL uh, kind of processing. Uh, so a couple of words about the structure of this presentation. So uh, first, we I, I'm I'm going to really quickly cover uh, what Trino is, how it is related to Presto. Uh, what is what its relation to Spark? Uh, uh, I, I mean to Hive. Then uh, we will also take a look into uh, Presto slash Trino history as an engine for batch ETL processing, and dive deeper into some of the challenges uh, associated specifically with batch ETL processing, as opposed to interactive querying. Uh, we will also discuss uh, the new execution capabilities that we are working on and, uh, and, and discuss how all these new execution capabilities make it easier for us to kind of deal with all the batch ETL uh, associated challenges. And at the end of the day, uh, I'll try to cover the current status of this effort, what is available today, what are we currently working on, and uh, what we are planning, uh, and how are we planning to evolve it in the future. Uh, so first of all, like very very quickly, like what, what is Trina? Uh, so uh, Trina is a distributed processing engine that is. Uh, that allows processing uh, very large data sets uh, distributed over one or more uh, heterogeneous data sources. And to do this processing, it also provides a very convenient and consistent uh, NC SQL compatible interface, what makes it th th this engine very powerful. Uh, to kind of uh, 
better understand what Trino slash Presto is, uh, it, it is worth mentioning its predecessor. Uh, so, uh, if, like Hive was kind of a first attempt to provide a SQL compatible interface for large scale data processing. Uh, so before Hive, there was Hadoop, there was MapReduce, uh, but with in order to use MapReduce, you would have to write uh, these jobs in Java or in like some other Java compatible languages. Or there's like there were some like other other alternatives like Pig that had a different interfaces uh, that wasn't very obvious and straightforward to use for everyone. So basically, Hive with, with Hive, uh, engineers were trying to address this. Uh, this problem. Uh, so with, with Hive, it was long longer, no, no longer needed to write, uh, compile, and deploy Java code, or try to understand all these other interfaces, like you know, like the one that Apache Pig was providing. Uh, so large-scale data processing was as simple as writing a, a SQL query. Uh, however. Underneath, Hive was still using the good old MapReduce platform from Hadoop that was originally designed mostly for this very long-running background processing. Uh, so queries written in Hive, they weren't really interactive. They were still taking long, and uh, the experience was kind of... Uh, the experience was not very interactive. So. Uh, in Hive, it basically to execute a query, uh, you'll have to submit it. You'll have to wait for a notification that you know it succeeded, uh, and then go and check the results. And it was bad if you like you went to check the results and there was actually an error, so you had to start this process over and over again. And it's the single iteration is taking like way too long. Uh, so there is like an anecdotal. Uh, 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 anecdotal reports from data scientists that uh, the data scientists at Facebook then in 2012 they were able to execute only as little as six queries a day on average in interactive mode so you can imagine how painful it was to do any kind of like data exploration or even even debugging or improving their uh, their their pipelines uh, so uh, it, it was like clear that there is a need for better solution for interactive querying. So in 2012, uh, Martin, Dane, David, and Eric, they, are, they started working on Presto also at Facebook. And uh, they aimed to provide an alternative to Hive specifically for interactive querying. As the key design philosophies they uh, set uh, is the strong adherence to open standards, so there's uh, no uh, kind of HQL or any kind of SQL dialects or anything, so there was like a strong adherence to uh, the ANSI SQL standard. So the idea was that anybody who knows SQL should be able to use this engine with no additional uh, uh, training or, or any, any additional problems. Uh, it also aimed to work out of the box, so uh, they were they were aimed to provide like a consistent platform. So with Hive, you would still need like Hadoop and MapReduce, and you need to integrate all these pieces together to make it work. And this was uh, supposed to kind of provide an out-of-the-box solution that you just deploy and it works. And, uh, and an open source model with neutral governance was another key principle in, in, in this project since the very inception. As it is important to it, when, when building this project, it is important to interact with broader communities to better understand what is needed and, and to, to, to move it forward. Uh, so for the timeline, so basically they started working on this project in 2013 and in 2000 uh, in 2012 and in 2013 uh, there were first. Uh, it, it was deployed in production and the first interactive queries started coming in. Uh, but soon after uh, after that, engineers even from outside the Presto team, uh, they built an integration with our, uh, with basically with Facebook's batch processing platform. 
and they started sending batch ETL queries to, to, to Presto. Uh, so it happened like really, really quickly in less than, less than a year. Uh, uh, so like at, at first it might, might feel a little counterintuitive. It's basically, okay, there is Hive. Uh, Hive is built specifically for this like large scale batch processing. Uh, so it is specifically designed for that. Why would you use Presta for that? Uh, right, and that's that's kind of like a very good question to ask. And uh, there are mainly two reasons. So first of all, it was still, it was much faster, right? So while the latency probably doesn't matter that much for bad jobs, uh, it is still, it is better if you can finish your job in 30 minutes versus an hour or in like 15 minutes versus two hours. So the, the speed of processing definitely does matter. Uh, but there was also a second, I would even say not less important reason why people start submitting uh, batch uh, ETL jobs to, to press them. And uh, to kind of like give you a little bit of a perspective uh, uh, to the second reason, I'd like to uh, tell uh, a quick anecdote from my life as an engineer uh, working on, on Presto and how I used to work with, with data. Uh, so uh, very often we had to diagnose some like slower running queries or some failing queries and, and so on. And for that, we maintain this data set called uh, Presto Query Event where a lot of like events from the Presto system were logged. And for each event, there was like a query ID attached. Uh, so what we could do, we could basically pull up these events by, by query ID and that would provide us some information that we needed for debugging, like you know how much CPU time uh, did uh, the execution take or maybe if there is like there was any warnings or if if the execution was blocked or anything uh, so in order to kind of investigate like any slow running of, of failed queries we went to this table queried it by by a query id and were able to come up with some conclusions uh, but uh, as you know like a uh, system like presto is integrated with many different systems such as metastore or uh, uh, or, a, or a block storage where the data is stored. So sometimes the culprit laid in, like, you know, in the, in the systems that Presto was integrated in. So what I had to do, I had to join data sets that were generated by Presto, that were generated by Metastore, they were, that were generated by, uh, let's say, uh, the storage subsystem uh, to kind of, uh, to, to get necessary insights. And then basically an original query that used to run just in a just a couple of seconds after I started joining all these additional data sets, it, 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 can, it, it, it can easily grow to run for like 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes. And where your query runs for like 10 or 15 minutes, it's, it's kind of difficult to iterate quickly to, to, to get more insights, like for example, to aggregate on different columns or to filter different things and so on. Uh, so to kind of get the interactivity back, uh, what I tend to you, you used to do is to go and create a, a materialization. So basically, create a background scheduled ETL job that would go and join a Presto data set with all the other data sets. Let's say once an hour or once a day, depending on granularity. Uh, generate a materialized table, so then I can simply query uh, at by again by query ID and get all the necessary information. It's just a, in a matter of seconds. And it, this was actually a pretty common use case because very often, like engineers or data scientists and so on, they had to join many different data sources together to to figure out some insights. And now. Uh, in order to convert my interactive query that was already built, so I already had an interactive query that had all these joins, they had it, it had all the proper conditions, aggregations, and whatnot. 
Uh, in order to convert it into a batch pipeline, uh, uh, originally I would have to go and convert it to HQL. Uh, that was the dialect that Hive could understand. And as doing so, I would have to uh, convert, uh, translate uh, all the UDFs, uh, convert SQL, and we have to run it at least uh, at least one time or more, depending uh, on the situation, uh, to check whether it produces the correct results. And all, all these steps are very time consuming because there is like intricate SQL uh, difference, in, in, intricate differences in SQL syntax. Uh, there are different set of UDFs. And of course, it takes time to debug it. Uh, and there, like, even, there were even many cases where conversion wasn't possible. So, for example, Presto was integrated with uh, Presto was able to query directly to query data directly from uh, MySQL, and then let Hive didn't have a direct integration with MySQL. So, if my original interactive query used to join some data sets from MySQL, and there wasn't even a, an easy way of converting. Uh, this query to a uh, Hive query. So the solution of running uh, the, the scheduled bad jobs in, in Presto, it, it came out pretty naturally because in, the only thing you need to do is basically just copy your interactive query, uh, paste it into a batch scheduling tool and you're pretty much done. Uh, so yeah, so basically the second, as I said, not not less important reason for running ETL in Presto was a unified uh, SQL interface for both interactive process, interactive querying and and batch processing. Uh, but uh, originally Presto was built for uh, interactive that has its own set of challenges, uh, but large-scale batch processing it comes with its own set of challenges and some of them are uh, queries that require a lot of memory so sometimes when you're doing this like large-scale processing you want to run very large joints or very large aggregations to either create a, a dimensional table or differentiate the differential table and you need to load a lot of data in memory in order to deduplicate or join uh, or whatnot uh, uh, these batch processing queries, they also tend to be more long running because in interactive people usually are not patient enough to wait more than like a couple of seconds. But for batch processing queries can easily run for like 10, 15 minutes, an hour or even like hours. And another big challenge was the resource management. Uh, so for Think of like a lot of this long running memory intensive queries being submitted all at once by the batch scheduling system. Uh, so the system, uh, so the engine uh, was, had to be smart enough to know like what queries to prioritize, how many queries it can schedule at once to do not run out of resources uh, and, and so on. And uh, in order to uh, understand why these large queries are particularly challenging in uh, Presto, it is important to understand how Presto executes queries. So in Presto, queries are split into a number of stages, and stages consist of like multiple tasks uh, that uh, are processing different, uh, different chunks of data within a stage. Uh, so the data ex exchange between stages in Presto is implemented in a streaming way. So in order for the task to make progress, somebody has to consume its output. So what effectively it means that all the tasks from, this, from, a, from the same query have to run uh, all at once. There is of course, there is like certain current cases where we can reduce number of tasks or number of stages running in parallel, but generally a mental model is that for, for general case, they have to run in parallel. So with this model, this model allows to achieve a very low latency with no checkpoint overhead. So it works great for interactive. Uh, it is also very well crafted, so it's, it, it, it scales quite well, it scales to like 1,000 nodes proven. Uh, 
Uh, however, at the same time, it is quite inflexible. So basically, it requires you to execute the entire query all at once and in an all or nothing manner. So the query can either uh, complete successfully and fully uh, or, or not. Uh, so there is no way of like suspending it or resuming or you know splitting this into a smaller chunk. It's basically like a single atomic unit that has to ex has to be executed all at once in an in an all or nothing manner. And so why why this makes things complicated when it comes to like memory constraint queries or to long running queries or to resource uh, or to uh, resource management so if since all the tasks have to be running concurrently so it effectively increases the amount of memory that must be available in a cluster in order for, for query to finish uh, it also makes makes it impossible to tolerate faults so in case of any failure in any task, the entire query would fail, and this is this this is this creates challenges for 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 these long running queries. And uh, the, the same, the, the, like the very same similar thing is with, with resource management. So if somebody submits w too many queries to a cluster, and at some point. Uh, the cluster runs out of resources it is impossible to kind of suspend one of the query or to uh, like you know deschedule it. it it has to be killed in order to let to to free up the resources and let the other queries proceed so it could also be very wasteful from the resource management perspective Uh, so how, how, how did we address this? Uh, uh, how, how was it addressed at uh, Facebook initially? So basically the idea was that, okay, let's just deploy these massive clusters, like 1000 node each with 256 gigabytes of memory on each node. And with that big amount of memory, it is unlikely for a single query to run out of memory. This is just a lot, a lot of memory. Uh, also, with uh, 64 uh, vir v, v cores available on each node, it is it is hard to imagine what a query has to do to, to run for hours. So usually, the queries tend to be not too long running with all these resources being available. So also, resource management becomes somehow a simpler problem. So the idea was to limit a single query resource utilization to around like five to ten percent of available of all, all available resources in a cluster, and then if if you have this granularity, you can kind of try to manage resources at per query basis. And uh, we also built this uh, kind of history based uh, resource utilization prediction uh, service. So based on history of previous run of a certain scheduled jobs, we could try to guesstimate resource utilization of a certain query and make some either admission or preemption decisions based on that. And with, with this approach, uh, this approach has proven to kind of scale pretty well. So we were able to scale up to 10 terabytes of distributed memory per query uh, with like several CPU years uh, utilized by a single query and we were also able to run 80 queries concurrently on a single cluster. So it worked quite decently. Uh, so up until now I, I've been mostly talk, talking about Presta, so basically uh, uh, now I'm going to uh, slowly transition to Trina. So at Trina, uh, just to understand what's the difference between Presto and Trina, I know Brian has already talked about this a little bit. So basically pre Presto was started in 2012 by Martin, Dane, David and Eric. And in 2018, they decided to leave Facebook and uh, focus on building a community centric project. So they created a fork called Presto SQL. It was later rebranded as Trina, but 
but this is still the, the same the same project. Uh, so when I when I joined uh, when when I decided to leave Facebook and joined uh, uh, joined the original founders as well as other co other contributors uh, keep keep the contributors at Starburst. Uh, I was kind of quite quite surprised to learn that Trino is not very widely adopted by the broader community for ETL and batch use cases. Uh, so together with Brian Jan, who also happened to be my colleague, uh, my former colleague from Facebook, we uh, run uh, a number of customer interviews uh, with uh, Starburst customers. We also talked to a bunch of users from the Trino community who try to better understand why uh, the community is hesitant of running this uh, batch ETL workload in in Trino, and as we run these interviews, we try to in, in identif uh, we started identifying some common patterns, and those were mostly like the, the same things. So basically, people were concerned about like memory constraint queries, long running queries, and the resource management. So, uh, for example, for memory constraint queries, it was all, all often mentioned that, you know, usually somebody runs a 10 node cluster, but then there is like the, this single query that requires a lot of memory to process, and they need to upscale their cluster from 10 nodes to 100 nodes just for the sake of this single query. And then, of course, it is like, it is not cost efficient. Uh, another another one was like long running queries. Uh, so in case if if anything fails, they had to restart their long long crack or long running queries from scratch, and it was messing with their landing time expectations. And uh, another 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 big challenge was the resource manager. It's basically people were expecting the engine to handle the admission and the resource management for them so they so the expectation was that you know i want to submit as many queries as i need or as i want and this this should be the responsibility of the engine to to kind of to make sure that the cluster doesn't run out of resources and all these queries can eventually succeed and of course, the workaround with deploying massive clusters wasn't really feasible because m most of, of these community users, they, they run pretty small clusters. They run like you know, 10, 20, maybe 50 nodes cluster, but nowhere near as like 1,000 nodes. And of course, they are not thinking about running like you know, 80 queries concurrently to let us do the resource management efficiently. Uh, so it's, it's not that like, Nobody in the community was able to use Trino for ETL. There, there, there were many companies that were actually doing this quite successfully. So one of them is Salesforce, and they actually have a very good uh, article written about how they're doing this. Uh, so uh, the, the very quick summary is to basically keep it short and sweet. Bas they are trying to avoid uh, long running and memory intensive queries and they are structuring and they are trying to structure their, their workload in a way that you know all the queries that they run in Trino are are small and sh and short running uh, while this approach works for some companies it may it, it doesn't work for everybody so first of all in order to to do to pull something like that you need to you need a team of highly skilled data scientists and engineers to properly structure your workload. And in some cases, it may not even be feasible or possible to, to, to restructure your, your workload because some algorithm and some queries are simply not uh, not decomposable or not, not commutative. Think, think of like a yearly report of like unique users over the last year. Uh, so, in, in order to address all these issues, we started to think. Uh, uh, so we, we we set our goal to kind of provide an out of the box solution uh, to for ETL and and to address all these uh, problems that were identified. 
So the goal was to provide uh, the necessary execution capabilities to handle queries of practically any size uh, at a cluster with limited resources. And it, we, we also wanted to provide resource management capabilities uh, out of the box uh, as part of Trina. So basically the idea was that you, know, you submit your queries to us and we will figure out what to do. And you don't have to worry about overloading a cluster or anything else. Uh, so very soon we realized that existing execution model uh, that is relying on the streaming exchange is just way too inflexible and it's like a very, it, it is going to be very difficult to be much better at, at these problems that we discovered with the existing execution model. Uh, because with streaming, uh, the execution model requires the entire query to be executed at once as a single unit and it prevents us from applying uh, more advanced uh, execution techniques. Uh, so after careful consideration, uh, we, we decided to actually remove this limitation. So the idea is to break down uh, this, uh, this streaming exchange limitation and instead of having a streaming exchange, introduce uh, a distributed buffer in between so basically tasks are not directly interconnected. Basic produce, uh, producing tasks, they will be writing into a buffer and consuming tasks will be reading from a buffer. And what it gives us, it basically it allows each task in a query to be executed completely independently of any other. And this simple yet very powerful uh, improvement uh, opens a lot like very interesting opportunities. So for example, when tasks can be scheduled one at a time, uh, it reduces the amount of memory that might must be available in a cluster uh, to successfully execute a query. So in other words, it allows to run a memory intensive query on a much smaller cluster. So if you look at this slide, uh, if you look at this slide, let's say if you have a query that runs, that has to run six tasks, and there is like each task on average uses 20 gigabytes of memory. So with streaming execution, you need to have 200 gigabytes of memory available in your cluster in order for this query to succeed. But if you can execute these tasks one by one, you only need 30 gigabyte of memory in a cluster in, in order for, the, for this query to succeed. Uh, it also allows fine-grained failure recovery. So basically, with uh, streaming execution, if any of the tasks fails, the entire query uh, is, is failed. So it has to be the entire query has to be restarted. But if each task is independent, if it fails, you can again you can you can start it over only a single task because each task is kind of is this like independent atomic unit that can be executed restarted uh, on on its own uh, so being able to execute a one task uh, at a time in isolation also greatly simplifies uh, the resource management so for example uh, it is no longer needed to maintain a, an external system for predicting resource utilization for your queries. So estimating resource uh, so resource estimates can be done uh, at a sing for a single task. And uh, because as, as you can see, like let's say if you have a, a if you have a query and you're trying to predict how much resources it will use, uh, there is like not a lot of information that you. have have so basically the only information you have is is pretty much how big is the data set this this query is going to process but uh, it is very hard to judge about all intermediate stages like for example how big of a join is it going to be or how long the aggregation is going to take or how much memory does aggregation need so there are certain te te techniques that you can use like maybe cost-based model or uh, or maybe some other techniques, but they are all very un unreliable. 
and the cost of a mistake is actually very high. So basically, if you made a mistake and then for what what not reason, you and then if you try to run this query and you didn't have you, you misestimated resources and now you realize that you don't have resources available to run this query, you have to kill it and start it over. So you kind of have you can waste a lot of compute resources. But if you are executing your query on a task granularity, you can estimate resources for this specific task. And for a specific task, you know exactly how much data this task is going to read. You, the, the number of operations within a task is also much smaller than in the entire query. So it is, it is easier to predict resource utilization for a single task. Like for example, if you know that the task doesn't read, uh, only reads five gigabytes of data, it's very, very likely it's not going to use more than five gigabyte of memory. And also, if you make a mistake, right, it's not a big deal. So basically, if you schedule a task and then there's no resources to run it and it fails, no problem. You, you, you adjust your estimate and reschedule just a single task. Uh, so uh, res resource estimates is just like one part of a uh, resource management problem. Uh, there is also the resource allocation problem. Uh, so uh, resource aware uh, scheduling is also becoming much simpler problem when you can schedule at, at the task granularity uh, because it kind of, it narrows down the question of whether I can run an entire query on a cluster to a question like if I can run this specific task on a cluster. So think about like a Trino cluster with like five worker nodes and you know that, uh, you, you know memory utilization at, at, at every node. Uh, it is much easier to give an answer whether you can accommodate one more task than whether you can accommodate an entire query that can be multi-staged and, and pretty complex. And also the cost of mistake is, again, is, is much lower. So basically, if you make a mistake with uh, the all at once execution model, then you have to fail a query and start over. But if you make a mistake only f at the task level, then the only thing what you, do, what you lose is just the runtime of this, this small task. Uh, another thing what makes, uh, what what makes uh, what becomes simpler is the resource sharing between multiple queries. Uh, so the scheduler pretty much just has to maintain an equal number of tasks running uh, between the queries that are submitted in the cluster. Uh, so we are also trying to size tasks uh, in, a, uh, in a in a similar way. So basically, we are trying to keep all tasks approximately of the same size. By size, I mean it, the time it takes to process it. Uh, so it, it's, it's usually it is easy to kind of rebalance resource utilization if a new query kicks in. And then in order to make sure that you know the, the resources are shared fairly, you just have to maintain an equal number of tasks running for, for all the all active queries. And it would be also possible uh, and relatively easy to add uh, different prioritization techniques. Like you know, if there is like some high priority queries, then uh, we may try to allocate more execution slots for that, that query than for the other. Uh, this new model also uh, allows, uh, also makes it much, much easier to implement adaptive optimizations. Uh, because queries can be suspended and replanned at pretty much any point, uh, what you can do, you can uh, let's say run your uh, build uh, run a, run a scan operation one for one table once uh, one table of a join run a scan operation for the second table of a join and if you see that it is the, the other the dif a different join order is more optimal you can you can uh, you can uh, uh, swap them. Uh, you can also dynamically switch from like broadcast to partition join. You can handle SKU. There's like many, many things you can do if you can suspend a query at any arbitrary point and replan. Uh, so the distributed buffer is designed to be fully pluggable uh, with a simple intuitive interface. So stripping out all the boilerplate, the interface is like very straightforward. 
So basically, it provides a writer API that is invoked by tasks, uh, by upstream tasks, and the reader API that is called by a downstream, downstream stage. And the API is pretty simple for basically for upstream tasks, it's just write some data for this partition. And for downstream tasks, it's just read this partition. Uh, so the API is like very, very simple and, and straightforward and easy to implement. Uh, for now, uh, we provide a kind of like a proof of concept implementation. It is not like it is not production ready. It is production ready. We kind of we, we try to craft it in a way that uh, that is reliable and everybody can use. But why do we call it proof of concept? It because it comes with limitations. So currently, it's fairly limited. It only supports up to fifty partitions, and it also requires a, a full barrier synchronization uh, between stages. Uh, that is also pretty limiting, and I will talk about that more uh, a couple of slides uh, down. Uh, but while it is limited, it also it all already allowed us to provide a ready-to-use solution that solves uh, a number of problems, and it also allows us to uh, this pluggability allows us to decouple development of like scheduling primitives and like you know core scheduling and from uh, the development of a better solution for for the buffering so we kind of do can do more things in parallel and execute faster uh, uh, so we're currently working on more advanced layered uh, buffer implementation uh, so it will be designed to uh, to utilize distributed memory as much as possible before falling back to storing this data to disk or to distributed file systems and this this implementation is also going to be designed to support thousands of partitions so we will we'll support like much much larger queries and uh, it will also hopefully not require a full barrier between stages and uh, that would allow us to also try to address a more kind of low latency use cases in the future because currently we are mostly trying to address uh, this like background processing for batch etl that is not as latency sensitive but for more latency sensitive queries uh, once we have this like a better better implementation that doesn't always touch disk and doesn't require full barrier we would try to also address the the low latency use cases as well with with this new execution capabilities uh, so on importance on, on importance of avoiding full barrier it's basically think of a query like a limit query so uh, uh, currently with a uh, Trino streaming, uh, it can short circuit. So basically, if a final limit sees that it received enough values, it can give a signal to the previous stage and say, okay, don't execute anymore, uh, don't run it. Uh, uh, but since currently our proof of concept implementation requires a full barrier, we actually need to run all tasks uh, with partial limits and only then we can run a final limit so it actually is slowing down some of the queries uh, and as soon as we no longer require a full barrier in between stages we can we can optimize it and achieve parity of, on that aspect from with the uh, with the streaming execution uh, uh, an another interesting current case is basically uh, this thing. So let's say you have enough resources in your cluster to run six tasks, right? So with streaming, Trino would schedule all six of them and all six will run in parallel. But with a fault tolerant execution, since today we require a full barrier, we first have to schedule three of them and then schedule the, the next three. So it effectively may reduce parallelism. Some some queries may start running slower, but once we, we no longer require a full barrier, we would be able to uh, again run more tasks in parallel. So we should be be able to achieve this parity. Uh, so 
now speaking uh, uh, about the current status. Uh, so at this moment, Trina already supports uh, iterative scheduling, it supports failure recovery, it also supports uh, the advanced uh, uh, fine-grained resource management. Uh, Trina also provides a proof-of-concept implementation for, for the buffer. It is limited, but it is fully working, a, a working solution and it's like it, it is production ready. There is actually several Starburst customers that are already enjoying it as part of our SaaS offering. Uh, so we are currently working, as I already said, on the better implementation. Uh, in the future, we are also trying to, uh, we, we will be trying to improve scheduling capabilities to uh, better support uh, uh, interactive use cases and close the gaps that I just explained uh, related to a full stage uh, barrier barrier that is that is currently introduced. Uh, uh, so for the early results, uh, with with even the fairly limited proof of concept implementation of the buffering layer, we managed to achieve. Uh, pretty good results. Uh, so we currently support join and aggregation that would otherwise require five terabyte of memory uh, available in a cluster uh, with only 100 gigabytes of memory available. So it is effectively means that you can run uh, a query that, that would require a 50 node cluster on a single node cluster. Uh, there are, there are community members that were able to successfully deploy and run three nodes on spot instances. So now since there is like there is failure recovery, you can try to run it on spot instances because you no longer care if a node would suddenly disappear. And some of them actually made uh, uh, implemented uh, some uh, out of scaling capabilities based on uh, CPU utilization. I think it's like based on Kubernetes. And they reported to achieve up to 60% of cost savings on uh, operating Trino. Uh, the solution is also well battle, battle tested under high concurrency. So we, uh, we tested it with, uh, uh, with overloading it with a lot of resource intensive queries with high concurrency and all of them succeeded. So. Uh, the resource management primitives are are, are also there. They're well tested and, and and are solid. Uh, so yeah, so you you are more welcome to more than welcome to try it on try it on your own and and see and and, and enjoy all these benefits. Uh, so as, as Brian already mentioned, Trino is a community-driven project and we would love to hear back from you. Uh, so don't hesitate to join us on Slack uh, as well to learn more about Trino and what we are, what are we uh, up to by following our broadcasts, meetups, blog posts. Uh, uh, also, please give us a star on uh, on GitHub and join our uh, join the discussion on the Project Tardigrade channel. This is the channel when we discuss specifically fault tolerant execution and all, all this uh, new uh, all these new capabilities uh, that I've just discussed. And if you uh, and also don't hesitate to ping me on Twitter if you have any questions or if you simply want to say hi. Uh, so, yeah, thank you awesome. for listening. Thank you so much, Andre. That was great. Um, I'll actually be at the Open Source Summit next week in Austin and presenting there. So definitely looking forward to that. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat, but as always, reach out if you have any. And yeah, like Andre said, feel free to join the Trino Slack. Um, and thank you again. And we'll see you next month.